all for being here. We welcome you to the first uh, seminar of uh, 2023. Um, so the usual format is about 20 to 30 minutes presentation, um, followed by 10 to 15 minutes question discussion. Uh, you can use the chat to ask your questions so you can raise your hand. And at the end, there is time for catch up that is not recorded. You're welcome to stay if you want. So for today's seminar, I am really happy to present to you um, Matteo Maron <laughs> from University uh, of Gabriele D'Annunzio, uh, Chieti Pescari in Italy. Um, Matteo is going to present uh, a, a work um, entitled Rock magnetism as an indicator of polyclimatic conditions in the late Norian early region in the late Triassic. The example of the Pignola Briola section in the Lago Negro Basin in southern Italy. So please, Matteo, now uh, share your screen and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Okay, try to sharing. Okay. So let's start our presentation. Okay, did you see? Yes, it works. All of you? Okay. Ah, thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. And hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Matteo Maron, and I'm here to present you this, our study that is actually about the use of rockmagnetism. Uh, as an indicator of the paleoclimatic and paleoenvironmental conditions. And we chose to investigate this interval, this is the late Norian early Ratian, the late Triassic, because it's, it's a particular time interval. Here we can see that we consider the part that start from the late Launian uh, around 218 million years ago, and up to the um, earliest Ratian is around 204, 205 million years ago. During this interval, uh, what we have is this um, warming period with an increase of temperature that started in the Olonian and ended uh, close to the Norian Ritian boundary. And the Norian Ritian boundary is characterized by the biotic crisis. We have the um, disappearance of uh, many bivalves, conodons. Um, some ammonite species and also some vertebrates. And actually what's happening at the Norwegian boundary is uh, not entirely clear because we all know the uh, Antriassic extinction is a major extinction event, but what's happening during the late Triassic and especially in the region is not much investigated. It's been investigated in the last 10, 20 years, but uh, is still going to we're going to try to understand what is going on. Uh, that's why ah yes, there's also an increase of temperature, a biotic crisis, and the global dirt, um, the global organic carbon perturbation that occurs at the later Triassic. So there's a lot of episodes, a lot of events that occur at this time interval, and especially at the passage between the Norian and the Ratian. So. Um, the section we chose to investigate is um, the Pignola Bureau section. Uh, it's a basinal section, it's charty limestones with shales. Um, it's located in the Lago Negro Basin in southern Italy, in Basilicata region. And during the late Triassic, it was located in the western Tethys. Um, this section here we can see is also this is the position of the Norwegian boundary. This is also GSSP candidate for the Ratian stage, and it has a, a very detailed conodont uh, biostratigraphy. We have also radiolarians in there. We have uh, um, a detailed magnetostratigraphy and also um, delta C14 curve. And as you can see here, it covers exactly the interval that you want to, understand, to study, which is. Sevatian and Ratian. He started for Lolanian. This is better for us. So, um, so we started to investigate our section using rock magnetic parameters. We have also geochemical parameters. We want to compare our rock magnetic parameters with the geochemical parameters, try to understand if they work as part of environmental proxies. And also, we'll see also which information they uh, will give us. 
Um, all the analysis have been performed at the Alpine Laboratory of Palomagnetism in uh, Pavarani and Milan. And we performed the, um, actually various in investigations. We try to be much, much more complete as we can. Uh, we investigate uh, natural and hysteretic isothermal remnants. Uh, we did some samples. We also do some hysteresis cycles, some forks. And also we investigate susceptibility. We measure the bulk susceptibility. We measure the term temperature dependence susceptibility. Um, just a quick look at the instrument that we used. Some of them you already know, I think, is the spinner magnetometers, and uh, they have the magnetizer we see that also uh, we use to acquire the ARM. And uh, we have also this instrument that is a quite an old impulse magnetizer, but uh, it's mostly working. Uh, it has a maximum field of 1.5 Tesla, but it's enough for us. Uh, the MFK2 that we use for bug susceptibility and temperature dependent susceptibility and the VSM of microsense that you can see here is located in Milan. The only other instrument are located in Paris. And so let's move to see what actually are the results of our investigations. Here the plot the curves, some of the curves uh, of the, that we obtained from um, our analysis. And here we used we can see all the raw data here, but we prefer to use um, a local regression smoothing to reveal the trends that are beyond these, you know, all these peaks that we can see from these parameters. So as we expected, uh, we did the monitor in 2015, and uh, we also had uh, um, quite low um, natural remnants. And yes, this, uh, these samples actually uh, didn't not surprise us because they also have very low um, natural remnants, not much to say in here. We have this just in little in increase here at the Norwegian boundary, but it's just a few points. It's probably not a big deal in here. Um, susceptibility has an increase. We have several peaks here, but the most interesting increase that it got looks like a trend is around the Norwegian boundary. And uh, it seems to mirror mostly what happens with ARM. Um, also, we have an increase of ARM that started from uh, uh, the middle part of the sections in here and the last up to the Norwegian boundary. Uh, we suspect it, it is an increase of magnetite, probably of some soft minerals, probably an increase of runoff, an increase of in more introduction of uh, magnetic minerals in here. And there is also a decrease of the grain size. We have um, calculated the ARM over IRM, and this is which is uh, a grain size proxy is used as a grain size proxy. And here we can see that we have this light decrease of um, of the grain size, but it's just located here. Actually, it doesn't seem to change too much for along the section. What well, most interesting is the results they obtained for the um, some of the IRM analysis. Uh, here we can see some curves of frustration, HRM, coercivity, and uh, all of them just show that here in the lowermost part of the section, at least up to 20, 23 meters from the base of the section, we have this increasing trend of high coercivity minerals. And also, just the, in the lowermost part of the radian, we have the same thing. We have this just increased. This must look like a more like a long time, a long trend. You know, is slightly increased, but it's uh, a long, a long term trend. Looks like this, but this, this, this one looks like a bit short. But then we'll see also in the time frame because the we are lucky with this section because this section with my stratigraphy has been correlated to the new KPTS. So every samples in here is, uh, can be actually uh, transported in a time scale. So that we later we'll see. Um, what are these high coercivity minerals anyway? Uh, here we can see, we are, you can see the hematite and magnetite, you know? So we actually interpreted this high coercivity fraction as hematite. Uh, we didn't just 
out of nowhere, but uh, um, in 2015, we did uh, some analysis of um, uh, some lower experiments, and we see that the high coercivity fractions as a, an unblocking temperature uh, of 630, 650 degrees, so is semotide. And uh, the lower, the lower, the lower coercivity fractions actually has a coercivity that, uh, sorry, a temper and blocking temperature that goes around 550, 580, more or less. So it's clearly magnetite. So these are the two main uh, magnetic minerals that carry the remnants in our samples. So when we see low coercivity fraction, high coercivity fractions, uh, we interpret it. Uh, with confidence as hematite and magnetite. So um, actually these two contribution here from hematite and magnetite to derive from their mixing. Here if I perform their, their, their mixing here, you can see the components that we obtained from the samples, usually are three components and uh, a high coercivity subcomponents in type of the hematite and two low coercivity components that we interpret as magnetite. Uh, these two components that are present in mostly every every sample that we analyzed uh, show that we have uh, uh, at least one component that has is quite dispersed. The coercivity is quite dispersed. So there's a large, uh, a wide dispersion, and we interpret this as probably the triton in origin. Uh, the second one is much more narrower. is a is a much more narrower uh, distribution. And we interpret it as probably of uh, autogenic or biogenic in origin. And we also perform some forks. Forks are quite noisy. Uh, and this is the best we have, actually. <laughs> uh, we didn't need too much because it takes a long time. But uh, um, we actually obtained this with the uh, microsens. We, we tried also forks with uh, um, uh, the micro mark. We didn't have the same resolution. Uh, we also tried to enhance a bit of the signal here, and we can barely see what it seems to be like a sort of central ridge. Uh, it's in some samples is hard, hard to tell like this if it's a center, a true central ridge. It's more evident when you move around the Norioritian boundary, actually. These are samples that are located around the Norioritian boundary. Uh, we have weak remnants. That's probably the cause of this noisy, uh, of these noisy forks. Uh, we have a lot of paramagnetics here. We can see for the um, uncorrected uh, hysteresis that we have a lot of paramagnetics. We have quite low remnants. Once you know, remove the paramagnetics, you can see that hem the magnetite is present, so you have a bit of, of hematite. Uh, if you try to put it in the day plot, even if they plot uh, works relatively with the complex mineralogy, uh, we can see that you are in the pseudo single domain area mostly and uh, along the um, SD plus MD magnet mixing curve of magnetite. So, but you know, uh, I don't rely too much on the day plot for this kind of samples in which we have we have magnetite, yes, we have also hematite. It is, it is evident, no load the section, although the samples. Uh, I would say. Here are the um, temporal tensor susceptibility. Uh, uh, here we can see that this is just four samples, but totally in all of the samples, uh, except maybe two of them that are really, really extremely weak. Actually. Um, but in all the samples, what we see is that we have an increase of susceptibility starting from 400 degrees. And then a sudden drop of susceptibility at 580. Uh, this, we interpret this, this uh, increase of susceptibility as new formation of, uh, of magnetite. And it's also justified because um, something new is forming because uh, uh, susceptibility changed a lot from the initial susceptibility during the heating curve and the uh, final susceptibility that you obtained once we cool down the sample. So something new has formed and from the um, uh, cooling temperature here, we can we are confident that it's uh, magnetite. Uh, the point is what is going, what is creating magnetite in here 
Well, um, we suspect this, they are um, iron sulfides because we have uh, rhomboids in there and there are a lot of uh, periodized radiolarians in there. There are a lot of periodized radiolarians. So we suspect that the pyrite can actually have a, a, a big role in the formation of magnetite in the samples of pinion aviola. Also, we can see here we calculated the um, alteration indexes of RUDA 2003, and you can see that alteration is higher at the nor boundary. boundary. That's the interesting thing because, well, we see later when we compare these curves with other curves um, from rock magnetism, we can see that and the and with geochemical curves of that to C14, we see that probably something's going on the nor boundary. boundary. So let's move to try to uh, understand what it, this uh, data uh, say to us about the um, paleoprimatic condition, paleoenvironmental conditions in this part of the Tethys during the, um, the late Norian and the early Rhetium. So what you can see here, here we are in a time frame. As I said before, we can move easily from uh, uh, meter scale and time scale because this section has been calibrated with the new KPTS. So in time scale, we can see that the increase of hematite that we have here actually start in the Launian. You have a peak in the Savatian that start to decrease, and it covers mostly the warming episodes uh, that you have from literature that it is obtained from the oxygen curve. The um, weathering phase of this increase of hematite, we interpret the weathering phase, uh, that occurs in the Ratian is extremely quick. It occurs just about the Norwegian boundary and it's extremely, extremely quick. Uh, the, um, the geochemical proxies from weathering uh, uh, actually show that we have a sort of increase of weathering here. Is much more slow. We don't have too much samples, unfortunately. This part of the section is not so lucky for geochemical data, unfortunately. Um, but here we have a, an increase again of weathering. This is really strong. From the chemical index of alteration is the, this proxy here. You can see that we have this sudden and huge increase of weathering here. Uh, this uh, uh, proxy here has been ca calculated. Uh, um, Recently, we are calculated for this work actually, and that involves um, elements such as aluminium, silic uh, silicon, uh, magnesium, sodium, and iron. And we have the, we run a PCA uh, to compare the amounts of the um, of these elements, the major elements uh, in our samples. Um, you actually see that we have an increase of weathering. We can see that there is a long term increase in weathering, and here it stays quite higher. So weathering starts from at least from the base of Savati and probably even more even uh, earlier, but continue up to the Norwegian boundary. What we can see here instead is that magnetite is actually really, really abundant at the uh, Norwegian boundary where we have this increase of probably iron sulfides that we, we interpret this increase of alteration here as probably the increase also of the iron sulfides that creates this new magnetite during heating and also corresponds with this negative peak here of the delta C14. This is the most negative peak in all the curve of the delta C14 in Pignola Briola and in general of the Norian. So there's the possibility, ah, just another thing. We separated the detrital contribution, the vagenic contribution. We've seen before from the mixing that we uh, interpreted uh, um, the two magnetite uh, uh, components, as one is detrital and one is biogenic. We try to separate them. Uh, what we can see here, is that the, what we interpret as biogenity actually increases as at the normality boundary, where we have the decrease of delta C14. 
The title magnetite is mostly present here in the late Sabatian too, where we have also that increase that we've seen before of ARM. So maybe an increase of runoff actually is present in the up in the Sabatian too, the upper part of the Sabatian. So uh, what does it mean? I mean, uh, um, the increase of biogenic magnetite uh, could be an indication that the redox conditions changed, and also we have this. Uh, what can I say? This increase of alteration at the lorelitium boundary on the samples of the lorelitium boundary, probably an increase of pyrites or iron sulfides. Both are indications that maybe we have low oxygen in that interval. And maybe we have sort of this oxia, or maybe even an oxia at the lorelitium boundary. As we said before, we have also pyrites of radiolarians. So, reducing conditions are active active at the norovitian boundary. So uh, we have a strong indication that probably we have. Maybe not in completely anoxia uh, because a lot of magnetite is well preserved there. So it's not extremely reducing condition going to dissolve then the, um, the magnetite, but probably this oxygen suboxia, we, 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 we have a change in reactor condition and probably a low oxygenation of the seafloor at the norovitian boundary. So, What's about the weather in the long term weathering? Because we we actually saw it is coherent with the increase of temperature that we have uh, in the Savatia. But uh, what's happening in the Western Tethys in particular? That's interesting because if we see that the increase of weathering that we have with the hematite here corresponds with the increase of the values of strontium. 87 over 86. An increase of strontium means strontium 87 over 86. So it is, means that we have an increased erosion of all the continental crust. And which continental crust we have exhumated in there, we have the similar origin that is exhumated in the Middle Late Norian. And uh, also creates a particular condition, particular climatic condition at the, uh, in the Western Tethys because uh, it actually works as a sort of barrier. Uh, it's, uh, um, the hot air that we have in the tropical region of the Tethys here is stuck in there. We have not recirculations of cold hair from the north as we have before in the first part of the late Triassic or in the rest of the Triassic. Uh, so here the sea surface temperature actually increased a lot. We have a lot of evaporation and we have also the origin that works as a barrier even from the hot hair that when goes there after the increased rainfalls, we have an increased rainfalls, we have an increased erosion, we have an increased weathering in there. So what is going on at the um, um, in the Middle East and Orient and also in the Ratian is that we have this increased uh, sorry these increased uh, temperatures and this uh, enhanced erosion in this part and because we have the similar orogeny. But what about the short term weathering that we have the Ratian? And this probably maybe, I don't know, linked to the uh, to the biotic crisis, well, it's possible. Uh, the point is, what are the causes of this uh, short-term uh, weathering phase that we can see here? Well, that's quite uh, a problem that um, we are not able to solve there entirely now, but what's interesting is, is that here, the, um, the geochemical proxies of strontium and also of osmium suggest that we have the erosion of large amounts of um, probably basalts or some um, young rocks in there. So one of the um, hypotheses that has been formulated by many authors even before this work is that they will probably have a large Indian province in the late Norian or in the earliest Ratian. 
The point is that we don't know which kind of leap can create this because we don't have the products of this possible large Indian province. We, uh, some in some autos start to um, connect Anga Yucham, is a terrain in North America, to, um, as, to embody it as a possible uh, cause of uh, the crisis at the Northern boundary. The point is that the Yucham is Northern age. This is the age span here. You can see the age span, but this is the central age, is 214. It's also true that the products of Anga Yucham are in part metamorphosized. So maybe part of these products are even younger than 207 years ago, but we don't know actually. So the point is that we, it's a fascinating uh, hypothesis is supported by um, by geochemical proxies, but the point is that we don't have the products of this large union province. Other options that have been uh, invoked for this crisis are the release of methane clutterates and an asteroid impact. Actually, we have Manikugan, we have Rosh Rivard. Manikugan is more Norian than Raytheon, is 215 million years ago, more or less. Uh, Rosh Rivard is actually close to the Norian boundary, 207 million years ago, more or less, but he has a, a large error in the age, so it actually can cover the Norian boundary. They cannot be excluded, but geochemical proxies actually exclude, mostly excluded or make it quite an improbable uh, hypothesis of uh, the crater, both the crater and, the, then the, and also the asteroid impact. So concluding, what we saw from our analysis and with compa the comparison with the geochemical proxies is that we have a long, for sure, long-term weathering phase in the Salatia. And given by the increase of temperature and also enhanced by the particular condition that we have in the Western Tethys, we have the Sumerian origin, we have this monsoon-like climate that is, is being uh, that in place in this area of the Tethys. And also, we had uh, um, something that is going uh, is going on around the world at the crisis at the NRB because we have uh, probably an oxia this oxia, um, and also at the short term weathering phase is very short as we seen before. It's a, a quick event, uh, but the point is that we still do not understand. We still don't know what are the causes. Most probably, is a large new province. We have to find this large new province though. That's the point. Uh, but that's why this part, I mean, of the work is interesting because uh, this is something that you're still work, going to work, to working on. We are st still investigate this part because it's quite interesting. Something is happening, but we have to understand why it's happening. And so in the future, we probably point towards this, uh, this investigation. And so these are the references to you, the works that I cited in this seminar and well, thank you thank you for your time thank you for your attention thank you very much Matteo thank you uh let's give Matteo being rather thank applause <laughs> thanks for the very interesting uh presentation um now the there is time for yeah <laughs> there is time for questions if the if somebody in the audience have uh, any questions for Matteo, you can raise your hand or write it in the chat. Uh, Yasmina, yes, Hello. go ahead. Yes, uh, Matteo, thank you for the presentation. It was very nice. I am uh, very interested, uh, basically, if you can elaborate on how you use the, I think it's called magnetic susceptibility bridge for the samples, because I have never used one and I am very interested in this parameter and I would like you to elaborate how, you know, how much sample you need to do this or, you know, things like that. Uh, you mean susceptibility? Um... If you go further up on your, uh, in your slides, it's, uh, you show the instruments. You see this? Ah, yes, okay, this one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the fern. Okay. Basically, yes. yeah, the uh, methodology of how you perform the measurement. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So um, this is the um, 
this is the, the main instrument that you, the complete set that you need to use. So um, you have this uh, uh, holder that is, uh, uh, well, and then you have to prepare the samples uh, by crushing them. You, have to, you need to use a powder, not too much fine, fine grained, not too much. Otherwise you risk to break the crystals, but not much, even not much coarse anyway. Um, so you have to prepare your samples, you have to crush them, uh, then you have to put the samples inside the, this sort of holder, and then the, the holder is connected to the machine. Then you have this water circulation in here that goes in there because you can reach temperatures of 700 degrees. So the instrument must be cooled, and we have to check that it's being cooled every time. Otherwise, it could be a really great problem. And then you uh, treat the samples by progressively heating it. So um, you can actually uh, decide at uh, uh, which temperature you want to reach, the time you want to spend to do your analysis, that uh, it actually means how many points you have in your curve and how much detail you have in your curve. Um, but actually, the preparation of the sample is quite simple because you just have to crush them. You just to use uh, an amount of uh, just a few grams. It's actually not a matter of weight. It's a matter of how much you put it. Uh, um, uh, inside the holder, you have to put uh, at maximum 0. Point we used 0 0.2, 0 0.3 grams, not much. Otherwise, you risk, if you fill too much the holder, the problem is that the um, the thermometer in there, there is a thermometer in there to check the temperature every time you do an analysis. It, you, you actually measure a point for your analysis. Uh, you have to check the temperature. And uh, if you put too much um, material inside, you can risk that uh, actually it's uh, um, attached to your thermometer and that, then cleaning it is quite a big deal and also you can in some cases you cannot even uh, you're not able even to remove it from the holder and that's a problem if you, because if you break your thermometer uh, it's, it's, it's a problem uh, we have a thermometer that works not because it was uh, actually not our mm -hmm. fault it was from uh, yeah, it was from factory. Okay. Ajiko said it was from factory. I trust him. So, <laughs> but it was quite a problem because uh, uh, if you if you have to uh, buy it, another one is quite expensive. Yeah, it's uh, two hundred euros more or less, okay. one hundred forty. I don't remember. I checked it, but it was quite a lot amount of money. But it yeah, works with powders. So yeah. yeah, I'm surprised you don't need. It's really very little of a sample that you need to do this. It is, yeah. Yeah, it's very very little amount. I mean, you can try even much more. But uh, the point is that, uh, um, as I said before, if you put too much amount of material there, then you mm -hmm. risk to, that it goes attached to the thermometer. It uh, depends also on your material. Okay, thank uh, but, you. But uh, is enough? Is enough? If it's if it has, uh, if it's enough susceptible, trust me, is enough. Our samples were quite as a quite quite very very, very not quite very low susceptibility actually, and it works anyway with this very very low amount of material. Great. Thank you so much for this. Was very helpful your explanation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat uh, from Fei Han saying, nice presentation. Thanks, Mateo. The question is, do you have any SEM or TEM pictures of the biogenic magnetites? Why do you say they are of biogenic origin? Yeah, actually, we don't have, unfortunately, the SEM or TEM. We, uh... We had the thought to do it, but uh, we did uh, this study was did uh, during pandemic. So we did also some have some problems in assessing the our lab, our laboratories, the paramagnetic laboratories, and the size this SEM and TM laboratories was quite a problem. Even after the pandemic, because there are a lot of people that 
want to use this instrument. So by now we don't have uh, uh, or TEM, uh, SEM or TM uh, uh, analysis by now. Uh, we are interpreted as biogenic origin uh, because of the um, narrow um, distribution that you have uh, in the uh, see here that you have in the uh, here in the a uh, mixing uh, which is usually related to uh, biogenic magnetite uh, and also on the forks the forks are really really really, really bad not ugly but uh, there is some kind of central region there so we suspect it's about biogenic origin in the future maybe we are going to do some more um you know uh, detailed uh, uh, analysis to find out if it's biogenic origin maybe uh, doing a work that's uh, stress about the uh, anoxia or this option well, what is this option um i don't know everything boundary maybe with more geochemical analysis in there so by now is interpretation that is given mainly by uh, rock magnetic parameters uh, but uh, in the future we can maybe have access to ECM or TEM and maybe try to you know photograph them and take a picture of these little crystals <laughs> hoping they're uh, oh, I think they are there I'm pretty confident they are there okay thank you very much um, is there any other question from the audience? Payan says, thanks a lot, Matteo. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Okay, well, if there are no other questions for now, uh, we can give Matteo another big round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really great to have you here. Um, if that's okay. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. <laughs> if that's okay now, uh, you can unshare your screen. Yeah, sure. Oh, we have one. We have a contribution from Richard Harrison say, saying, hi, if you want to send me a fork file, I can see if I can improve the smoothing. Okay, I can send you uh, all of them actually if you want. <laughs> they are not much. They are just the, the eight that you saw, so not much of them. But uh, I can send you the samples by email if you want. If you can write me maybe your email here, I can send it by email. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. That's fine. Well, thanks, I don't think uh, they can be thanks. worse than they are now, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But send me your email, maybe or writing here in the in the chat. Maybe you can send the the, the files. Okay, thank you very much. I'll send you the false file. Okay, so thanks again for your presentation, Matteo. Uh, just a quick update. The the next uh, seminars are the uh, uh, by uh, Yasmina Mart. Oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> Yasmina Martus. That um, um, on the 15th of March, then on the 29th of March, we'll have uh, John uh, Tarduno, and uh, keep an eye on the mailing list because there is uh, there is a, a both good lineup of uh, of seminars, but also we have free slots. So if you want to present uh, at Magnets, please get in touch with us. And all previous Magnets, and including this one, are on our YouTube channel. You have about 100 presentations to view if you're interested. And we are slowly working on adding the subtitles to the previous uh, seminars. So if you want to also help with that, get in touch with us. And uh, thanks again and see you next time.